Hi everybody and welcome to our behind the scenes look at one of the most important races in all of Star Trek. As Gowron might say, today is a good day to die, or as Koloth might say, today is a good day to live. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture and here are 10 production secrets you never knew about the Klingons. Number 10. There was exactly one reason for the original redesign of the Klingons. Dollar bills. Now we're gonna get to a lot of discussion about how the Klingons evolved to look the way that they do in this list, but let's actually start with Star Trek The Motion Picture, 1979. Now this was the first time that the Klingons went through a redesign, and for a very simple reason. Star Trek The Motion Picture, as it was one production, had a much higher budget than the budget that would be spread over an entire season of the original series. Once makeup artist Fred Phillips learned that they were going to be making a feature film, the first thing he did was he went to Gene Roddenberry and he said, I want to make the Klingons look more alien because he was never really satisfied with the look that they were given in the original series. As actor Michael Dorn related years later, he said that what they did they did because they could. They didn't do it because there was any kind of thought process behind it other than this will look good on the big screen. It's different from say the design that the D7 originally had for the original series versus the Katinga that was then introduced in the motion picture. The Katinga was effectively the same ship, but the original filming models of the D7 would not have stood up to the scrutiny of the big screen. You could argue that there was a little bit of that going on in the redesign of the Klingons, but once Mark Leonard slipped on those ridges, it really was just because it looked cooler. Number nine, yes, Kalos is based on Jesus. Kalos the Unforgettable is the ultimate warrior in Klingon history. He has a lot of parallels in his story with the traditional story of Jesus Christ. He was the very first Klingon to unite the tribes of what would become the Klingon Empire, which he founded. He slew his brother Morath and then went on to become the greatest warrior that ever lived. He died and also promised to return. Now, of course, in the story of Jesus, Jesus was born, lowborn, in fact, as was Kales. Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph. He would then grow up to die for the sins of mankind and come back. Kalos was supposed to come back to usher in a new golden age of the Klingon Empire. Now, TNG's episode, Rightful Heir, teased out this theory, but also crucially showed that not everyone's just going to accept this, not everyone's just going to believe this. And that is something that they really wanted to address in that episode. One of the cutscenes from Rightful Heir actually spoke of a story where Kales stood in front of an army of Klingon warriors, cut his palm and said, do this in memory of me. That was a little bit too on the nose, so it was cut out of the episode. He's not the only influence behind Kales. King Arthur and a lot of Viking lore went into the story of Kales as well. But if there was one most direct influence, it would be Jesus Christ. Number eight, they were created by Jean L. Kuhn as a one-time only villain. Errand of Mercy arrives toward the end of the first season of the original series of Star Trek, and that's where we get our first glimpse of the Klingons. The Klingons were made specifically to be cheap. Earlier in the season, of course, we had Balance of Terror and we had the introduction of the Romulans. Now, the problem with the Romulans was that the ears cost a lot of money to make, which is why they didn't go on to become a recurring villain, or at least not as much as the writers and producers would have liked. And even if you think of that episode, you only see two Romulans with their ears, the rest are all wearing helmets. However, with the Klingons, you had Burlap Sacks standing in as their chainmail, and you also had, which is really quite funny when you look closely at it, their metal studded belts were actually painted bubble wrap just so it would look metal on screen. Now, of course, the makeup effects were very, very cheap. All you had to do was darken the actor's skin, add some bushy eyebrows, a little bit of facial hair, and you were good to go. Which is why, although 
iconic Star Trek writer DC Fontana was very much against this, the Klingons went on to become one of the more common villains in the original series. She found them not to be as interesting as the Romulans, which arguably at the time they weren't. But history has shown us that they have evolved to become one of the most deeply rich people in all of Star Trek. Number seven. Yes, the original Klingons were a racist stereotype. There is really no discussing the original series Klingons without addressing the fact that every one of them is in blackface. And it was written into the script that these new villains were supposed to be hard-faced warriors, orientals. That's actually a quote from the description of these uh, new aliens. Later on, after the original series, makeup artist Rick Stratton would end up working on the motion picture with original makeup designer Fred Phillips. And he recalls some very questionable labels on specifically the Klingon makeup pads. Mexican number one, Mexican number two, Negro number one. And these were just the accepted makeup palettes for the Klingons. It's a little unclear as to who exactly they were most trying to be a stereotype of. They are clearly meant to be a stand-in for the Russians, for the Chinese, for the North Vietnamese, and for the North Koreans. They're sort of an amalgamation. You have Genghis Khan as well as an influence there. So it's sort of a roughly North East Asian influence, but not done with any particular care or respect to the source. So it is uncomfortable to watch some of the early episodes featuring the Klingons, which in a way is a great shame because a lot of them are very well written and very well acted. Number six, after escaping Freddy Krueger, or not, Nancy went to work with the Klingons. Now we're gonna leave the original series for a second and we're gonna go all the way forward to Star Trek Into Darkness. As many of you may know, I am a huge horror fan. Not quite up there with Star Trek, but then again, I am psychotic when it comes to Star Trek. No, Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the absolute classic staples of horror cinema, and Nancy Thompson is herself an iconic final girl of horror cinema. So it might interest everyone to know that she had two very important roles in Star Trek Into Darkness. I say two very important roles. One is a very important role. One is a role. She is in the film. She has a cameo. Now, she's so heavily made up that it is absolutely impossible to recognize her without knowing that it's her. She kind of looks like a kind of a red fish thing. Her real role on the film was herself and her husband, David Leroy Anderson. They are skilled VFX artists. That's the trajectory that she went with her career after not leaving acting, but certainly not making acting her priority. They were hired by J.J. Abrams to bring concept designer Neville Page's Klingons to the big screen. And they succeeded in redesigning the Klingons while also sticking closely enough to what the audience had seen before. What they did is they kept the ridges, but they added some more ceremonial type outfits and garb to the new Klingons. Now the actors who played the Klingons were cast purely if they looked intimidating enough. They were, the filmmakers were going for a very specific direction with these Klingons. The addition of piercings to the ridges, and I'm already smiling at this one, earned them the nickname Blingons, but they do look fierce, and that was what they were trying to go for with Star Trek Into Darkness. Nancy Thompson, moving away from a man in heavy prosthetics, went on to play a very large part in another race with very large prosthetics. Number five, Kortar and Shelka are the Klingons Adam and Eve. We venture a little bit back toward Christian influences here on the Klingons. When Balana Torres has a near-death experience in Barge of the Dead, she wakes up to find herself on the eponymous barge and she comes to meet the ferryman. Now this is Kortar, who was in fact the original Klingon. Kortar is Adam, Shelka is Eve. Now Shelka actually isn't named on the screen. This is from the production notes itself. In the Christian version, Eve 
ate the apple, and so did Adam, causing God to expel them from the Garden of Eden. Kortar and Shelka's story is a little bit similar. The gods created the beating heart of the Klingons, and the heart grew lonely, and so they brought forth another heart. We know this from the traditional Klingon wedding ceremony that we of course saw in York Cordially Invited in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, where you had Worf playing Kortar and you had Jadzia playing Shelka. The slight change between the two is that whereas Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, Kortar and Shelka rose up and slew the bloody gods. As Worf said, they were more trouble than they were worth. Kortar was punished for his act of rebellion. He was then assigned the task of ferrying the dead and dishonoured to Grethor. He then moves away from Christian influence to Greek influence. He becomes, in effect, the character of Charon, who ferried people across the river Styx to the underworld. And the Charon itself would be name dropped later in Star Trek Discovery, as it was the name of Emperor Giorgio's flagship. Number four, they were named after an LAPD officer. When Gene Elkun came up with the idea of the Klingons, he devised the race and their beliefs and their actions before he came up with a name. And in fact, he got the name by pure happenstance. He overheard Gene Roddenberry talking about a friend of his, Lieutenant Wilbur Klingon, as in C-L-I-N-G-A-N. So Klingan or Klingon. Kuhn ran with this and devised Klingon as the name of his new villains. While he liked it, and Roddenberry liked it, and Robert Justman liked it, although the producer did say that at one point he thought he wasn't sure if the name was a tribute or a punishment to Mr. Wilbur, but um, DC Fontana hated it. This may have stemmed again from the fact that she was a bit bitter that the Romulans weren't coming back, but also she thought the name was dull. And Captain, we're being attacked by a bunch of Klingons. Ugh. So yes, without context, you can kind of see the point there. There's been many Klingon jokes throughout history, and God willing, there will be many more. But time was against everyone. So once the name was decided, that's it, it stuck. They became the Klingons. Now, funnily enough, that officer, Lieutenant Wilbur Klingon, he, long after retiring from the force, used to introduce himself as the very first Klingon, which is quite an honor. Number three. John Kalikos helped devise what the Klingons originally looked like. While we know what was in the script in terms of how the producers roughly wanted the Klingons to turn out, no one actually knew how this would physically be realised. So when John Kalikos, who played Kor in Errand of Mercy, was given the script, he thought, Okay, what, what does a Klingon look like? Ah, it's fine, the makeup department, they'll know. I'll just go and I'll do my lines and it'll be fine. So he read a script over the weekend and he came in to sit down for the makeup, at which Fred Phillips, makeup artist, asked John Kalikos, so what does a Klingon look like? The two men kind of had a bit of a laugh about the fact that this was the blind leading the blind. Neither of them had a clue. And no one could really give them much direction other than those few descriptions that were in the script. So, John Kalikos came up with an inspiration idea that, that borrowed a bit from the, I'm sorry to say, racist Fu Manchu caricature of Chinese and Asian stereotypes. He asked for the long mustache to be added and he walked with a very slow, determined gait. He didn't add an accent, thankfully, but he did ask for his eyebrows to be bushed up to the nines. Now, funnily enough, he was very proud of what came out of this design. And to a certain aspect, he was right. They were quite a striking villain, even though they came from such a dodgy inspiration. Now, years later, he would joke when he returned for Star Trek Deep Space Nine and played Kor again, he asked, you know, can I, can I do this without the ridges? And he was told flat out, absolutely not. At which point he joked, being a Dahar master is great and all that, but you don't really get much power. Number two, the original Klingon emblem 
was in front of our eyes in the next generation. Lesser known facts is that the traditional Klingon logo that everyone knows, the, the triangle with the pointed legs for want of a better word, that's not the original logo for the Klingon Empire. In fact, in Errand of Mercy, there is a very different logo, very prominently displayed throughout the episode. Now, as you can see, it's, it's sort of like a world with fanned wings coming horizontal out on either side. It's on the letterheads that Kor uses to give his new directives to the people of Organia. And there is a very ornate torch on the wall that's there for the whole episode. What's more is that on the sash that Kor wears, it's bearing that emblem. Fast forward to 1987. Worf is now serving aboard the Enterprise D as the only member of the Klingon Empire in Starfleet. He is wearing Kor's sash. It is a direct reuse of the prop. Now, funnily enough, that prop was a burlap sack that still managed to last. Unfortunately, it didn't last all the way to all good things, and that's a remade prop. But on that sash, you have the original Klingon emblem. Because if you think, if you look when Worf switches his baldric out for the metal one, he's now wearing the emblem of the House of Moog. That original Klingon emblem is gone, and this is presumably after they realise that, oh, we, we kind of can't use that one. So, for the entirety of the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, that original emblem from Errand of Mercy is on screen and visible. Number one, Discovery's Klingons had evolved hairless to make them better predators. A lot has been said about the redesign of the Klingons for Star Trek Discovery. A lot. I'm not actually here to bash the people who don't like the redesign of the Klingons. It is very, very striking of a difference. However, it's not different for difference sake. There is actually a very, very careful logic in how they ended up looking. The Klingons, with their elongated heads, they have sensory pits that run up and over their skulls. This is sort of like a python. It's that effectively, Brian Fuller wanted these Klingons to be better warriors, which meant they could effectively see all around them at all times. What's more is that apart from the sensory pits, they were all bald in a ceremonial way. This was because they were remembering the story of when Kalos forged the first battleth. He cut a lock of hair from his own head, dunked it into a river of lava, and then twisted it to form that battleth. To celebrate that, all of these Klingons shaved their heads during times of war. It was drastic. It was very drastic. And going into the second season, these Klingons were toned down a little bit. They were given hair again, and despite some obvious differences, they do look much more in line with the Klingons that audiences had come to recognize. Their armor also had a very specific reason for existing the way that it did. It's quite bulky and it covers the entire chest in a, it seems like kind of a rigid and frankly, not very, very aerodynamic kind of way. That is because these Klingons were said to have twice as many organs as humans, and therefore they needed more protection, which is a little bit ironic that this warlike race is actually in one respect, a little bit weaker than humanity, or perhaps I should say, have more weaknesses. This costume design was something of a collaboration between original costume designer, Sutirat Anlar Larb, who had actually departed Discovery with Brian Fuller, and also the ongoing costume designer, Gershif Phillips. They designed something that would be beefy, strong, and striking, and it worked. It really, really stands out. Phillips later revealed that there was more plans for the Klingons in terms of CGI to go with the eyes and animatronics, and as often happens in TV productions, the budget just wouldn't allow for it. So, love them or hate them, we got the Discovery Season 1 Klingons that were seen on screen. Whatever else can be said about them, they are certainly memorable. 
Guys, thank you so much for joining us for this production, you know, nerdgasm type video today. If you enjoyed this video and if you'd like to see more like this, please drop that into the comments below. If you would like to see us cover a specific race, please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Whatever you do, make sure that you remain legends. I want to see busts of you in the Hall of Warriors. Kopla, and thanks a million, guys. Cheers.